I started from my basement as a contractor and eventually grew it to 18 states and 173 million in sales. Booyah, baby! Either the next guy's gonna win the deal or you're not gonna get the deal. The velocity of information through your company. We understand that like this is valuable stuff. I think the contractor should be talking directly to the carrier because they're doing the work. You don't brand yourself as being an expert, then you create your own following. It's the nightmare of being a small business owner. You just happen to have found this amazing niche. Hey guys, Anthony Domenico, SVG. Some of you know me. My new, that's my new thing, you know me. Right. <laughs> Doug Reitmeyer, we're here today with Doug Reitmeyer at the Speakeasy at SVG. Doug is the CEO and founder of? GC Experts. GC Experts. Government Construction Experts. Which you are the, I don't know if it's true, but they say you're the undisputed. <laughs> World's number one. Federal government contract expert. National federal contractor. In the planet. Yeah. Obviously the whole planet. You better be the top yeah. one on the planet since we're covering the U.S. Yeah. That's <laughs> sure. what we do. So Nice. So, Doug, a little bit. Now, you've been to the Wind of Storm Conference uh, the last three years in a row. A lot of guys have taken your session or your right. training breakout session, gotten some good feedback on it. Um, some of you guys have signed up for your three-day. You have a three-day course. Right. Is it in Texas? Or? Yeah, it's called Mastering Federal Contracting. Mastering Federal Government Contracting. And the whole idea is in three days, they go from whatever they've been doing, but now they can add to that. They become a national federal contractor, so they can work in all 50 states with their current license, but on eminent domain federal properties. Right. There's over 468 federal agencies, and those agencies spend about $270 billion a year. It's almost $300 billion. Stuff. 300 billion, that's even bigger than a storm restoration industry. Yeah. And if you think about it, uh, on an annual basis, if you broke it down per business day, that's the equivalent of writing a thousand one million dollar contracts every day. So the government's writing the equivalent of a thousand one million dollar contracts today. They're going to do the same tomorrow in construction. So it's a, it's a huge sector for those that understand the game and want to get into it. Mm -hmm. Massive opportunities. So we're talking about the federal government contracting industry for some of the folks that are watching us. Some of the guys know what that means. We're talking about all the federally government-owned buildings. We're talking about the yeah the White House roof. Yeah. We're talking about the <laughs> Pentagon roof, right? Yeah. We're talking about museums, certain federal. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a lot of buildings. I think there's something like what nine hundred thousand. More than nine hundred thousand. Commercial, mainly commercial. Uh, all types. I mean, but it, including residential. You got could, could be housing for the military. And uh, right. park ranger homes, right? So we had a contract out of Big Bend National Park, 36 park ranger homes. Uh, a lot of national parks have cabins that they rent out, right? All of those buildings. Are federally government owned buildings. So it could, so could run into residential. I know some folks on our page and that are in our network uh, are all working on a military base in the uh, Hurricane Michael area right now. Right. I can't remember the name of the base, but it's it's General's Homes right. as much as it is facilities and, and chow halls and everything else that got damaged by Hurricane Michael. Yeah. I mean, if you go back to, you know, the federal government has owned this property known as the Philadelphia Shipyard. It's a massive facility there. They've got housing for the admirals and the guys that work there. You know, they bring in the... Uh, the nuclear ships there and they renovate them. I remember one time I was working at Kearneysville on a uh, USDA agricultural center. Mm -hmm. And I was up on the roof and I noticed that the roof was deteriorating and I was putting new chemical fume hood systems in. And I didn't want the government to accuse me of causing a problem in the roof if they had a leak. And I said, look, you got a problem here with the roof. And the guy says, yeah, I see that. And I said, well, I just don't want to be blamed for the roof leaking, right? And I looked across and I saw a number of buildings on the property in Kearneysville, West Virginia. And I said to the guy, I said, you know, how many buildings do you guys have? And he says, well, you mean the Department of Agriculture? <laughs> I was thinking Kearneysville, right? Right. And, uh, but I, I said, well, I was thinking Kearneysville. He said, well, we got 13 buildings here. And I said, but, you know, the Department of Agriculture has, well, we got 11,000 buildings. Wow. One small, one of the 458 federal agencies has 11,000 buildings. Wow. And they all need roofs, right? Right. <laughs> and so if you're doing a roof every 20 years, that's an average of 45,000 roofs a year. Yeah, I think there's a statistic you gave me a couple of years ago that said, you know, the federal government probably replaces up to 45,000 roofing projects every year. Every year. Okay, and so for a lot of guys, it's a mystery, as it was for me many years. I'm actually a disabled vet, so I'm a veteran. So at right. one time about eight years ago, I remember trying to get into the federal government contracting for my old company. Right. 
it was a ton of paperwork and I had to go to a conference and a seminar. And to be honest, even when I left there, I still didn't know how to access right. and get registered and certified. But that's what you specialize now is to help contractors out there, roofing contractors, general contractors, you name it, learn how to access, get, get registered, certified, and set up to do business with the federal government, correct? And, and actually do it. So we work sometimes side by side with the guys. I'm doing projects with some of the guys right now, replacing a national historic building roof in San Francisco called the Boathouse built in 1890. That's one you sent me. Yep, I sent you yeah. the, the, the pictures, the eagle view on Did it. Did any of my guys call you on that? Well, one of the guys that went to your show, I don't know if he's in your memory. Graham, program. I think Graham. Did Graham come? Uh, I think Graham, I gave it to Graham uh, to call. Yeah, but one of the guys that went to win the storm, saw us, came to our workshop, then went out, saw this roofing project, he got the contract, and then I said, hey, do you have to have know anybody in the area? And I think these guys that you sent, they were intimidated. Oh, it's federal government, right? Well, it's paperwork right. you're going to fill out. And, that's and, scary. And there is paperwork, right? But that's why we have all the templates and the, mm -hmm. the systems in place and the training. Much like you have for Storm Ventures Group, we do the same thing on the federal By the way, side. if I remember that lead correctly, it was a cedar shingle roof, it an was. old cedar shingle yeah, roof. Absolutely. And you guys had something like 2000 a square allotted? We got paid $5,400 a square. $5,400 a square for a cedar shingle roof. So yeah. that's that's a very yeah. high price. Yeah. So you're telling me the federal government contract works not all low bid? It's It can be low bid. Uh -huh. And in this case, it was the only bid. And why is that? Okay. Most of your guys are, they're licensed contractors, right? Mm -hmm. Then they're in a pool of the licensed contractors in the United States of about a million. There's a million licensed contractors in the United States. And they are typically going after the $600 billion worth of construction work that's not federal. If you take that million licensed contractors and you say, well, how many of those are registered and qualified to get federal contracts? The number's under 30,000. That's incredible. Right? So and you don't have a lot of guys bidding on the same projects. The, well, saying. that's the whole, the right. whole thing. You've got 97% less competition. I mean, think about that. When your guys go out and they're competing for the roofs, how many other contractors are typically competing for it? some of those million licensed contractors. If you're in Dallas, Texas, it'd be like 10,000. <laughs> yeah, it, it might be a large <laughs> Anybody number. you yeah. Google, you know, you yeah. got like 10,000 contractors. But a lot of our contracts are guys that graduate from our workshop. They go out there and they're consistently hitting. There's no other bidders on the, on the job. Now, does your company not, not only teach them how to get registered, certified, and set up to do business with the federal government, but also how to interface and do the bidding yeah. or access the bidding process? Because yeah. I think that would be a little- Everything. A everything. Z, yeah. So getting registered qualified. We go them through 26 hours of in our workshop training, right? Mm -hmm. So they learn all the business fundamentals. They learn all the training of how does the money flow through the government? How does it get allocated? Who gets it? How does it get distributed? Because you've got streams of money. Street, you know, think of that. A well, thousand, one million dollar uh, contracts a day. The right? Trump, Trump just supposed to kicked in a lot for all the all the new projects. All the military. You yeah. got a massive budget increase for the military. So you've got all of those different bases, and they're all around the country. I mean. Oh, how far are you right here? You got military bases right here. Luke Air Force Base, mm -hmm. for example, is right around the corner. How far away are you from there? Yet, yeah. how many contracts have you done out there at Luke? Me, none. Yeah. <laughs> no. <clears throat> but I've got a guy that I never made it through the paperwork, here, right? man. I never made it through that paperwork eight <laughs> okay. years ago. I was like, man, this is, I, I gave up. I'm like, this yeah. is too much. So, so, so your company alleviates that process of getting contractors set up, registered, and certified at lightning speed to do business with the federal government. 26 hours they go from what they've been to a national federal contractor with all the confidence that they can go out there and succeed in that. And now you're gracing us with your presence at the Wind of Storm conference again. Well, it was an invitation by you. Yep. I, couldn't, I couldn't refuse. We get, a lot of, we get a lot of good comments. We always bring back, the, we bring back the people that get a lot of positive comments. If we can teach entrepreneurs some new revenue stream, some new profit margin or ability to increase their profit margins, or how to get more sales or secure more deals, we bring those folks back because they're adding value to the, right. to our industry entrepreneurs, which is what we're looking for. Let's kind of backtrack a little bit, Doug, because I, I know what you do, and we'll, we'll kind of get back to that. Tell us a little bit about you know how you got into this industry. I know you got in back in 1976. Right. How'd you get into it? Uh, you used to actually do the federal government contract work, so let's start there. Well, I was in the Army. Right. Uh, Hoo-ah. Yeah. Hoo-ah, <laughs> that's, mil that's a military term. I got drafted, right? I had a low draft number. What was your this, MOS? Uh, it was AIT, Advanced Individual Training, 35 Foxtrot, which was nuclear weapons electronics. Ooh. So I got recruited. That means he had to be, right? he, he would have had to been smart on his uh, 
on a military test. Well, I was that. a physics major in college. So okay. That that was. See, I was infantry. The, yeah. So you get the lowest score on the what was the ASVAP test or yeah. what was it called? I, I don't recall yeah. because it, you know. For you can me, get the lowest score on that, and, and they still let the infantry in no matter what. Just keep in mind that was like 50 years ago for me, right? Okay. So I'm an old guy, but uh, yeah, when I got out of the army, I had to have an income. Uh, my son Sean was an infant and a beautiful wife, and had to make money, and so I started doing service work, uh, HVAC and electrical, and got a so HVAC contractor. Yeah, an electrical contractor, got a plumbing license, and then started building homes with a, a home build. We teamed up where I was doing the MEP with all the mechanical electrical plumbing, and then became a mechanical contractor, a union contractor in Austin, Texas. And I had a guy screw me out of $20,000. You, you, you ever had anybody screw you out of money? That before? never happens. Yeah, yeah. That never happens to anybody watching this. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I had to go to the bank and borrow $20,000 to keep my credit good. The bank to pay off a material supplier? or. Yeah, okay. material supplier. And uh, the banker looked at me and said, well, how are you going to pay me back? By that time, I was dabbling in federal contracting and kind of figuring out the game. And I just said, well, I'm only going to do federal contracts. Was the paperwork as hard back then as it is now? Or? Uh, probably not, okay. you know, but it, it was still a challenge, right? right? But I was figuring out, I, I had friends in procurement at Fort Hood and they were bragging me out there, hey, you need to learn how to do this. Hey, wait, Fort Hood, so you were in Texas back then? Yeah, I, I, would, I got out of the Army at Fort Hood, Texas, yeah. and I lived there. I had bought some And now you live in there. Austin, Texas, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And that was a few years later. But what happened in Fort Hood was um, these guys were saying, why don't you come out here? You can do this construction work. It's mostly MEP type work that the general contractors weren't bidding because they didn't know how to do MEP. Mm -hmm. And so I was dabbling in that, and I noticed that you know the pay was really fast, right? Every two weeks on a percentage of that. from the federal government yeah. contracting work. Okay. Yeah. So you get paid once a month, but you get paid on percent complete, and they pay you within 14 days. So it, it wasn't like I had to chase money. Right. It was automatic. And what I was beginning to realize and understand was that unlike the other world. Right, that I was living in at the time, where people had to take money out of their pocket to pay me. Mm -hmm. The federal government, it wasn't coming out of that person's pocket. It was coming out of our taxpayer's pocket, right? right? And so what dawned on me was that that person couldn't get the paperwork off their desk until they paid me all the money I owed, they owed me, right? So it's called entitlement. You, you earn it, you're entitled to it, they want to get it off their they desk. So they that pay paper. It. Right. Yeah. So because they got, you know, they had seven contracts to get awarded mm -hmm. and what's coming right behind those seven? Another seven, right? Right. And and so you're helping them get this work done. And so I told the banker, he said, How are you gonna pay me back? Because I'm only gonna do federal contracts. And he said, Why? And I said, Because they're the only ones I know that when they run out of money, they just print more and they do it legally. <laughs> and, and he laughed and he owed me the money. That's <laughs> funny. This is twenty thousand dollars in nineteen seventy six dollars, right? Uh, which is probably like two hundred thousand today. Yeah, yeah, about ten times. See, yeah. Gasoline was twenty five cents a gallon. Right. Uh, brand new Corvette was sixty five hundred bucks. You know, sixty five thousand a day. So yeah, it's about ten times more. So you can imagine a twenty six year old kid going into a bank and wanting to borrow two hundred grand, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, he and that I worked. Were, Oh, yeah. The money? yeah, he gave me the money. See, these right. days, they still want to borrow it to you. They I need to see three years <laughs> yeah. of audited financials, right. and you better show this much EBITDA. But, uh, yeah, that was before credit bureaus. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I never looked back. And he became, so you got in, you started, doing the, you started doing the work. Just doing federal contracts. You know, yeah. I heard a number, I don't know if it's true, but someone said you did a billion with a B, yeah. a billion dollars of federal government contract work. More than a billion dollars. More than a billion. Yeah, all, worked all 50 states. And one, one thing guys watch this right now need to know, and I, and I remember going through this eight years ago when I was going to jump into this segment, never did, but you only need a license in your one, in your one state. Yeah. And so when you're working on a federal government building in, in Hawaii or New York or wherever, as long as you have that initial state license or your initial qualification, you don't need a license in all 50 states or in that particular state as long as you're on federal government property. Is that correct? And you and you can show that you're qualified. You show right. that you're qualified, which is right. something you do in the beginning. Right. It's uh, You get registered at SAM.gov where they... You fill out all the information, and then you pick out certain cage codes that you say, I'm qualified for this type of work. Mm -hmm. And then it expands as you do more types of work. Right. So one of the things I had figured out But was, you definitely know you don't need to go get a license in each of those states no, no, no. to get on those Or buildings. cities. I mean, I had okay. one guy, uh, Randy Gates, come from Los Angeles, and about an hour and 11 minutes into the workshop, I'm talking about the $100 million worth of work I did in California. And he said, well, how many cities were you licensed in? 
And I said, licensed in? What, what do you mean? And he goes, well, in California, you have to be licensed in every city. And, and I said, I, I've never been licensed in California. And he looked at me and he goes, it's taken me 20 years to get licensed in 13 cities in California. <laughs> and one of the guys in the workshop said, well, I think you just got your $5,000 worth of you know, in the first hour, right. hour and 11 minutes, right? When well, it sure. dawned on him that he could now do what I was doing in all a 50 A lot of guys right? watching this right now go through painstaking process, as I used to, to go get, you know, a hurricane hits Florida or a hailstorm hits uh, Denver, Colorado or, or a different suburb of Colorado. You're not right. licensed there. You got to go get set up, go through all that paperwork, get licensed, produce insurance, and that can slow you down three months even to get in and get set up just the licensure itself. Right. So that's a, that's a great benefit on federal government contract where a lot of guys don't know that. Yeah, and when you think about it, uh, wherever that tornado hits or wherever that hailstorm hits, it's hitting federal buildings too. Right? Yeah. And so it's getting in with those agencies, letting them understand that you know you're qualified and that you and you can do that work too, right? So you want to be on their list as well. Now, do you think any of those do any of the federal government buildings are they primarily self-insured, or do you think some of those facilities have? No, they're all. They're, they're also, they issue the contract or the purchase order right there. So they're, right. so they're not going through a whole insurance claim process on those buildings in like post uh, Hurricane Michael. No, they're 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 self insured. Yep, taxpayer money. Yep, so you're getting paid. Yep. <laughs> so you got in there in 1976. You passed military guy. Um, now you had some family, some sons. Uh, you brought your sons into the business as well. Yeah, I know one of them came to win a storm last year. Right. And, and then uh, something happened with one of your other sons, interesting story, that really changed uh, the direction of, of you in the industry. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be here um, because I was a national federal contractor. I had over 300 federal clients uh -huh. that would call me for their most important projects. I, I got called by the FAA, Terry Brady, up in Chicago to put up the first Doppler weather radar to measure wind shear. And, uh, you know, that was a pretty high-profile job, right? In 1985, I don't know if you know, Delta had a flight coming into Dallas, experienced wind shear, and mm -hmm. broke the plane in half, so people died. So it took them 15 years to develop radar that would measure wind shear. And the first one they had ready to go up was at Chicago Midway O'Hare Airports in Crestwood, Illinois. I and you took, that, you took I that project took on? that contract, put that first one up. And, uh, what was the size of that contract? Uh, $1.8 million. $1.8 million? Yep. Nice. We made $900,000 on it. What was the profit margin? Yeah, yeah 50%. Shh, cover yours. 100% right? <laughs> of cost, 50% of the As contract. it should be? Yeah, uh, but that was kind of an unusual because the reason I got the call in Texas was the mayor of the city was threatening them with a federal lawsuit because they wanted to take his land as eminent domain to put the radar system on, and he was the most popular mayor in America at the time. And so they were afraid. Dale, that, was it Daly or? Uh, no, no, this was the mayor of Crestwood, okay. a guy named Chet. Uh, he's since passed away, but um, he was 72 years old when I met him. And he owned the property and he was developing it. And uh, he'd been mayor for 42 years. And you can literally Google, you know, most popular mayor in America, 1999, and it's this guy Chet out of Crestwood, Illinois. I think his son is the mayor now. But uh, he, he basically, I went in and said, you know, what's the problem? He said, well, I don't understand why they can't move it. I said, well, let me get with the FAA. And the FAA said, well, we can't move it because the road would be too steep. I said, well, suppose I fix that. Well, we've looked into it. I said, yeah, I understand, but suppose we fix that. And he said, well, if you, give me 24 hours. Let me see if I can fix that, right? And so I went back to Chet and said, hey, you know, here's the deal. The road's too steep. Can we figure out? You have a city engineer? So he calls Chester over. Chester's 74 years old. Chester says, yeah, we can spread the road out, but it's going to go in the next city. And of course, Chet says, that's no problem. I'll just tell the mayor we've got to go into the next city, right? And uh, so he gets the, the deal done. Next day, I turn it into the FAA. They approve it. I call Chet back. And he, He's like, wow, that's really great. I said, now I got to build it, Chet. So he said, well, I can help you there. Just come on over to my office. Mm -hmm. Next day, I go in there at 10 o'clock. All his contractors that had been doing all his development sitting in the room. He looks at me and he says, uh, he introduces me and he mm -hmm. says to the guys in the room, he said, uh, uh, Doug, do you have a budget for this thing? I got a contract for 1.8 million. So I just go, 900,000. He looks at the guys in the room and he goes, uh, you guys tell Doug how to divide up the money. I want it done in 90 days, and he walks out. These guys sitting there with pencil and paper. They write down, here's how we want the money divided. Hmm. 90 days, now, does, it still work, done. does it still work like that today, or are you going to go through some more hoops? 
well, that was an unusual guy. Yeah. You know? Uh, but what do you think all these contractors in the room are waiting for? Get this out of the way so we can go build his Walmart and, and, right. and his Home Depot store on his property. Right? right. So it didn't matter what the number was. But, you know, things like that can happen in this mm -hmm. business that you just don't expect. So, but you know, one of your sons, you brought your sons into the business. One of your sons had a uh, unfortunate boating accident. Traumatic, traumatic brain injury. And, and that really changed your direction in the industry from and actually doing the work. Yeah. So, so talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that was... Uh, August 6, uh, 2005, and he was star flighting into the hospital. I was actually working at Cornell. Was it a boat, boat collision? Yeah, correct? boat collision yeah. at night. It had rained, so there was <clears throat> cloud cover, so there was no light. And there was a big black boat out there with no lights on, and he, he ran into it. Head-on collision? <clears throat> kind of glancing off the side, but he got his skull crushed. Uh -huh. and they actually had to remove part of his brain. Now, he was in the business, too. Um, he was actually in the real estate business real estate by then. Okay. He started out working with me as a teenager in his young 20s. And he got a job working with Dell, selling computers when Dell was growing back in the late 90s. And then he became a real estate agent. So and this was, was at the pinnacle when you were busy as busy as can be doing federal government contract work. Yeah. And so you had to deal with this situation here. And this kind of, you had to close out jobs and really change, change, well, change course. You know, uh, my other son, Sean, was in the business and I had a team of guys. So when, when I left... The business, I said, here's what everybody needs to do. I'm going to work with Ryan for the next, and for five years, that's what I did. So you yeah. left federal government contracting to help your son built a, a brain rehab center out of his home. Yeah. So he could rehabilitate. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that, went, that went on for five years, correct? Yeah. And then what happened in 2010 was I was getting phone calls from guys that I had been in the business with saying, you know, you, you need to come back into the business because there's this $147 billion of the $787 billion of the American Recovery Reinvestment Act that Obama got. Right. And, and I, I really didn't feel comfortable doing that. So uh, I read an article in the newspaper about contractors all starving to death and, you know, this is terrible economy and everything. And I'm sitting there shocked that people don't know that there's a massive profitable opportunity. How to connect with the, right? with this part of the industry, the federal government contract. And, contracting and so I wrote the, I sent the girl an email that had written the article. It was on the front page of the Austin American Statesman, our newspaper in Austin. And what was interesting was she didn't respond to me. She sent it to the editor of Commercial Construction Magazine, a, a guy named Mike Pallarino. And Mike sent me an email. She said, is this guy full of shit? <laughs> that was. I think I read that article. That's how I bumped into you. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Show me the money. Yeah. And and so he sent me. He said, if what you told her is true in your email, would you write an article about it? Sure. Right here. Here's the market. It's this massive construction market, and it's got this super charge kick of an extra hundred and thirty-seven billion dollars. Right. But nobody knows how to get into right. it. Right. Um, right. And and here's why contractors are not in the game. Right. We explained to them that mm -hmm. they've got. You know, they think that it's the government and it's going to be a lot of problems and paperwork. And to some extent, that's true, but no different than getting licensed to be a contractor here in, in sure. Phoenix, right? I mean, you got to go through a process, mm -hmm. right? So you got to go through the process, um, except that there's no fees to it. You can do it free, right, with the federal government. So I explain why contractors aren't in the game, but then mm -hmm. I say, here's why they should be. Mm -hmm. There's this massive amount of opportunities out there. And there is again right now, by yeah. the way. Oh, yeah. It might even be bigger. Yeah. It might be a bigger package than what Obama did. Uh, the, yeah, the Trump it's, package. It's not, I won't say it's bigger because that was a massive one-time, you know, over a three-year expenditure that I haven't seen quite that much. That's that's a huge amount of money. They they kicked that thing up with seven hundred eighty-seven billion dollars. Wow, I mean, that, that's massive to kick into the economy right. to stimulate it. Right now, what's interesting about that? The American Recovery Reinvestment Money was that Congress gives the president money to operate the government, but they tie strings to it. So mm -hmm. much has to go to service disabled vets. So mm -hmm. much has to go to um, yep. hub zone businesses, historically or, or under female or business. minority yeah. owned businesses. Woman, yep. I'm doing a, a woman owned contract right now. Women owned business contract. One of my workshop graduates, mm -hmm. a woman. And she got a contract at Fort Hood, two hundred eighty thousand dollars to replace some grease traps for the dining facilities. So guys, up. so guys, if you're a female-owned business, an ex-military guy like 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 me and Doug are, or a, or a minority-owned business, there's a lot of guys that, that are that qualify for that watching us. And I think you have to own fifty-one percent or more, correct? Yeah, absolutely, there, fifty-one yeah, there's, percent there's or more. Rules yep. that, you know. Um, this this might be a great thing for you guys to take advantage at Windstorm or connect with Doug because uh, 
they ha- they call it set asides. Right. They have to set aside a, a certain portion of that federal government contract work for for those particular entrepreneurs, right. which is great. Right. And, and then we so we explain that that's that's why you should be in the game, right? And the process is fairly straightforward and fairly simple as far as getting registered and qualified. But then it's okay. Now I'm registered and qualified. It's like getting a contractor's license. What do you do now? In your now I got to really learn how to bid yeah. on it and sell it and get yeah. the, create the relationships. And what really impressed me about you was that you had really had this vision for putting that into a training system, right? Where you could train each part of the company. Well, but on a yeah, but on a, on the as we call it the storm restoration side. So it's interesting because right. you and I kind of kind of. Kind of have some similar way, you know. I was a I was a storm restoration contractor, a licensed roofer, and licensed GC for geez, almost fifteen years. Right. Working between eighteen states over that time, and then about four or five years ago, I had a breakup with my partner for a hundred thousand right. reasons, and just lost the taste of getting back into the build side. Right. And then moved into this segment, which I thought just like you did. Wow, there's a real there's a real niche here. Right. To help the entrepreneurs, especially with all these explosive, catastrophic storms and events, Hurricane Michael, increased hail, hail storms every year, to help retail contracts and storm contractors uh, improve the efficiency of their companies. You know, sell, build, collect, right. sales, operations, collections, operate. You know, all that kind of stuff. And it really moved into that niche. Similar, you know, for different reasons. Yeah, for but, different but reasons. similar. And it really wasn't a, you know, there's not, there wasn't really a lot of resources for guys, at least for me, when I was going through this, there wasn't a book, right. there wasn't a school, there wasn't a, a class. I had a couple mentors, some guys that helped me out, but there really wasn't anything out there to help me learn what we call the $100 billion insurance restoration industry. Now there is, you know, virtual right. training, you got the Wind of Storm Conference, there's other guys stepping up in different areas. Uh, your industry is similar. It's kind of it's been a, myst- a mysterious niche, right. still is to a lot of people. And I think, you know, guys like you and I are changing it. Well, and what happened was, um, once I, that article got published, show me the money. That yeah, that's how I, that's how I found you. Yeah. I, I came into that article. Yeah. I remember that. And, and then uh, I got started asked to do speeches at construction shows. Can you come give a talk and explain this federal construction market, right? And uh, the first one was uh, the Construction Expo in Houston, which is a pretty good size show. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they had something like 800 people that were there for the wanted to see that presentation. I got an email from the the guy, the owner of the show, two days before the show, and he says, you know, I've got more than uh, twice as many people signed up for your presentation as any I've ever had in the 27-year history of the show, right? Mm-hmm. But 2010, remember, contractors were starving, right? And here's somebody saying, yeah, I got the bird feed. <laughs> here's the food, right? And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I realized when I came off stage that the only way to really do this is to bring people in, we can sit down with them and say, look, there's a process to do this. You know, it's one thing to get registered qualified. It's one thing to get a contractor's license. Another thing- How do I go after the go, business? Yeah, how, how, do I, I how do I secure the deals? The, and that's what was so impressed me about you, was that you had the foresight and the vision of, here's how I'm gonna train people to do it. And that's what I was doing over on the federal side. Mm-hmm. So to me, it was- By so, the way, two massive industries. Think about it. You're, yeah. so you're, the federal government contract industry guys, 300 billion, the storm restoration side, some years 100 billion last year was 300 billion globally 136 billion uninsured losses this year it's probably gonna be 100 plus again uninsured losses in the u.s those are two massive industries in addition to your regular booming retail market and they're complementary complementary so i you know i I would be complementary to you and your business on that side and you would be complementary why not have both why not have both revenue streams exactly Right. I mean, if you're if you're a contractor, you want know, multiple revenue streams. Those would be two good ones. And so we tried that in 2017. Did your presentation down in Miami, and we had pretty good success. And some of the guys came in, and they were and they they did it. They knew the business, and they were learning from you on the business side of things. And then they were coming over to me, learning how to do the federal stuff. And so when they had the downtime between storms, they were running over here, going, "Well, you know, I got all this federal stuff, how mm-hmm. to do this, right?" I know of and, several guys I've gotten uh, emails. Hey, thanks for uh, introducing me to Doug Reitmeyer guy at Wind of Storm. I actually landed my first, you know, 180,000, or I can't remember the numbers, a couple yeah. hundred thousand, you know, some smaller contracts initially. And I remember getting those those emails. So yeah. it did work for some guys. Yeah. You know, and so we're bringing, guys, we're bringing Doug back. That's a great story, man, how you got into the industry. We're bringing him back. We're actually going to shoot a teaser course today inside SBGU. Okay. So we're going to we're gonna give him a short training on what is this business? How do I get into it? How do I get connected with you and some of your, uh, you know, you get some three-day right. uh, in-depth certifications. But a teaser course today for Inside SPGU. We're going to also bring Doug back. 
and his team to the Winter Storm Conference on February 21 to 23, 2019. Going back to Vegas. Everybody had a good yeah, time in Vegas. Yeah, and I want everybody to know, this is the only live presentation that you get to see me, right? But I promise to be make, it, make it worth your while. Um, and for those that have been thinking maybe they're not going to come to the Winter Storm, I would highly encourage you to come to this week event, if nothing else, for the presentation on the federal contract. So this is the only place you're going to get it. Yeah. So yeah, it's a great, you know, we like to bring a lot of different, look, there's a little bit of something for everyone at Windows Storm. Some guys are interested in just coming to network. Right. Some guys just want to walk the trade show floor, meet with their favorite vendors and have a beer. And some guys like different different options. Yeah. So we have the 75 breakout sessions. Guys, Doug's going to be heading up. Uh, he'll be on stage this year. He's going to also head up a breakout session. And then we're giving him a special segment on the last day of the show. We're giving them two or three hours in that main conference hall for guys that want to sign up for your extended class. Right. They can go ahead and get that in-depth uh, training right there at the Wind and Storm Conference. This year on Saturday. Yeah. That means well, you can't go out and drink Friday night. <laughs> we 100% unconditionally guarantee you that the last two hours of this show will be the most valuable business content that you've ever had. And learn how to I get promise. set up. You're going to learn how to get set up, registered, certified to do business with the federal government which, by the way, includes some lucrative FEMA contracts and stuff like that. Yeah, nationwide. Okay. All right, guys. See you soon. Okay.